Hey GRCC, Jamie here. I hope everybody is doing well during this time. As always, feel free to reach out. Good morning and welcome to Grand River Community Church and our online service. We're glad that you've cho chosen to join us this morning and we hope this service will be a blessing to you. Uh, as we begin, we just want to give you one more announcement from uh, our pastor of youth uh, and on-site athletics, Jamie Hauer. Hey GRCC, Jamie here. I hope everybody is doing well during this time. As always, feel free to reach out if you ever need anything. Uh, just a phone call away. Uh, if I can do anything for you to make the times easier, better, more manageable, uh, we'd love to be able to do that for you. Just want to say hi and, uh, and to let you know that, yes, the summer is coming soon. Yeah! We are looking forward to another uh, great summer of sports ministry. And we've got our league coming up in May. We have our summer camp starting in July. Uh, as always, uh, God continues to bless us. Uh, through this ministry gives us great contacts with the community. Registration for our league and camps are actually opening up sometime this month or early next and so be watching for that if you want your kids involved in either of those things. As well, uh, we really need you uh, to spread the word, especially for our league having taken a year off. Uh, we really need that support that way of letting people know that we're back at it, we're looking to do it again. And so please, uh, you know, let your neighbors know, let your friends know, family, anybody with young kids uh, who are looking for a great sporting experience. God has remained faithful in providing amazing volunteers to make these things happen. And we are counting on Him to do that again. And so I reach out to you this morning in hopes that you would consider volunteering with us, either for our soccer league or for our camps. Each of us have been given various talents and gifts, and I think that there's a wide enough range uh, within our league and our camps that everybody there could have an opportunity to uh, to support the ministry in some way and so in order to make this thing uh, get off the ground and to thrive uh, as we have been we need those volunteers and let me just say our church family has been amazing in making a great league and great camps and so i'm appealing to you to to help us out this summer there's going to be a slide coming up in just a moment with the various ways that you can be involved as well as dates, times, location. Obviously a lot of this stuff is going to be subject to change and of course all of it right now is sort of up in the air and if it's happening or not. But we're, we're going to move forward with the confidence that it is going to happen. So I hope you can have that same confidence, sign up with us, commit to volunteering and uh, making a great summer for some families. Starting this week, myself and Ron and others are going to be making some phone calls to see uh, if people are available, and I hope that uh, you would consider partnering with us. Thanks everybody for your consideration, for your time, and once again, look forward to a summer with you, uh, reaching people with the gospel. Thanks.
Well, even though we are gathering remotely, one of the things that we're hoping that you're able to do is participate with us in, uh, in worship. And, and so part of what we want to do with that is to be able to have music that you can sing along to. And the first of the songs we'd like you to join with us in in worship is I Want to Know You. I'd encourage you wherever you are to, uh, to join along singing in your home or wherever you may be.
presence overtake my heart. I want to know you. Would your spirit overwhelm me? Would your presence overtake my heart? I want to know you. Would your spirit overwhelm me? Would your presence overtake my heart? Let's pray together as we continue in worship. Father, thank you that because of your great grace, we have the opportunity to know you. Father, you know each one that is listening to this online service right now. You know the ones that will listen in days to come. You know each heart you see into the very depths of our being. And Father, I pray that right now you would just uh, draw near to each person, wherever they are in their home, whether they're, uh, whether they're driving, whatever they're doing, whether they're gathered with others, whether they're alone. Lord, I pray that you would meet the needs of each one. Father, there's some that maybe need to understand uh, what it means uh, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and to come to know you through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you'd help people to understand more of that today. And for those who by your grace have come to trust in Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would create within us in this new year a greater desire to know you. And so we want to offer all of this service to you. Uh, we want it to be for your honor and glory and praise. Uh, and we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want you to join again in worship in the singing of In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone, my hope is found. He is my life. My strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving Home, 
thing to know that uh, we can be forgiven of sin and uh, this is a brand new year and maybe for some of you uh, you've set new year's resolutions maybe spiritual new year's resolutions and and maybe already there have been problems maybe already you've experienced uh, some failure in that and you may feel overwhelmed at times D- David that one of the great kings of of Israel poured out his heart to God at different times and one of those scripture readings one of those is uh, or the psalms are, are many of the times when he cried out to God uh, and one of the great psalms that talks about the forgiveness uh, that we can have and the effects uh, of guilt uh, is in Psalm 32 uh, and let me read that for you Psalm 32 this is the word of the Lord how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My vitality was drained as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledge to you my sin, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when, he may, when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters... They will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, again, I want to thank you for each one that is listening, wherever they are in their homes. Father, you know us. You know the very depths of our hearts and minds. You know the things that this week that we have failed to do that we should have done. You know every sin we've committed. You know every evil thought, every word that was spoken inappropriately or in an unkind way. Father, I pray that you'd help me. I pray you'd help each one that's listening not to hold on to our sin or ignore it. Father, we thank you this morning that we can confess it to you. And if we're trusting in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a great promise that when we confess and acknowledge our sins to you, you are faithful and just, and you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a joy it is to to know how blessed are we when we are forgiven. Father, I pray that people listening to this this today, whether it's this morning, whether they listen at another time, Father, I pray that each one might be able to realize that there is a way to be forgiven, to be pardoned, 
to be set free of our guilt, that we can rest in you, we can trust in you, we find hope in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, help each one, even now where they are in their, in their homes, to acknowledge their sins to you and to receive the forgiveness that only you can give. And help us to continue to, to focus on you as we worship today. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Invite you to join with me again uh, in singing uh, another song uh, led by our good worship team, uh, Jesus All for Jesus. Well, 
She did call and said something about choosing the wrong way and getting a little lost in the woods. So hopefully she joins us soon. Oh my, that reminds me of what I came to talk about today. Except I wasn't lost. I thought Jesus was lost. That must have been so scary. I know, once I was lost in the store because I was looking at all the toys and I was so scared. But you know what? My mom said she was even more scared than I was. She gave me the biggest hug ever when she saw me. I couldn't breathe. She squeezed so tight. Does that sounds like how Mary and I felt. We were heading back home from the Passover festival in Jerusalem and had been traveling quite a while. A day, I think it was. It was getting to be bedtime, so Mary and I were looking for him. You know, where, when you're an older kid, Jesus was about 12, you want to be with friends and other family, right? Well, we thought he was with them, but we looked everywhere and we asked all our friends and our family where he was. No one had seen him. Have you ever felt that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach? Or when your heart is in your throat? Oh yeah, many times. When I lost my favorite teddy bear and then I was lost, my mom, when I lost my mom in the store. This time, I felt a million times worse. We frantically searched high and low, going door to door, asking everywhere and whoever we would see. It took us three days to find him. And guess where he was? Hmm. Maybe where he last saw you? I know I would be crying my eyes out if I couldn't find my mom and dad. Mom always tells me that if I ever get lost, to stare where I was so it would be easier to find me. Oh wait, maybe he would be in the temple because he's Jesus, so he would want to be there. Yes, you are right. He was there sitting with the teachers who looked around with, who looked amazed with everything he was saying and the questions he was asking. Oh yes, because he would know a lot since he's God's son. Yes. When we asked him why he would treat us like this, disappearing on us, he said, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? We were very puzzled at this, but watching him in the temple and at being at home asking questions to the teachers showed Mary and I how special he is. I mean, I'm just a carpenter. I didn't learn and have wisdom like Jesus does, even at the age of 12. But Mary knew, especially as he grew up, she knew that this was another sign that Jesus is God's son. He was obedient to us and as his earthly parents, but he was obedient first to his heavenly father. Wow, that's so cool. Even as a young child, Jesus was growing and learning, but also showing how he was God's son and sent to here to earth to complete the re his the rescue mission. Thank you, Joseph, for sharing your story. And thanks for having me, Zoe. Now I get, guess Ruthie is really lost. Tell her I'm sorry I missed her. I will, thank you. Bye. Look, I finally made it out. Hallelujah. Oh, Ruthie. You just missed Joseph. Really? Oh man, I got turned around in the woods, but I finally found my way. Well, I'm glad. Now we can do our verse together. Okay, I do know a tune we can use to learn it, so let's try to sing it together. Yay! The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We've seen his glory, glory of the one and only. Keep working and remembering your verse for this month. Say it or sing it at supper, before bed, while brushing your teeth. And it helps us remember God's word. And that's one of the important things that we need to learn is remembering God's word. Yeah, I love saying it while brushing my hair. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> 
gonna go tell my parents that I'm on my way out of the woods. See you later, friends. Bye, Ruthie. <laughs> Bye, friends. See you next week. Bye. Well, thank you to our Discovery Zone children's team for, uh, uh, for that puppet play. I uh, invite you, if you don't have a Bible yet, to go find one uh, and, uh, and pull it out. And we're going to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 3. The, some of the verses will be up on the screen for you. We're continuing uh, in our series on Philippians that we've entitled Unchained, uh, Living in the Freedom uh, of Joy. Uh, and uh, in some sense, we may feel a little bit chained up in these, this month of uh, January of 2021 because we're in lockdown. Uh, and so our services like this one are only online. That's why you're watching and not uh, perhaps present at, uh, at your own church or at Grand River Community Church. Uh, and we haven't had much to laugh about. Uh, and so I want to share some things I, I, I've been working on, some things I've been working on because in 2021, uh, Lord willing, I'm going to become a grandpa, uh, and so I thought I should brush up on my dad or my granddad humor, and I th especially as it relates to, to COVID and some of these lockdown uh, measures. Now, maybe, maybe not everybody's going to appreciate this. I know Jamie Hauer loves these kinds of jokes, and I know my next door neighbor uh, does too. So here we go. Just some thoughts to share with you. Why did the chicken cross the road? Because the chicken behind it didn't know how to social distance properly. Mm -hmm. Ran out of toilet paper and started using lettuce leaves. Uh, today was just the tip of the iceberg. Tomorrow remains to be seen. What did they call, why do they call it the novel coronavirus? Why do they call it the novel coronavirus? It's a long story. And what do you call panic buying of sausage and cheese in Germany? The worst case scenario. You're welcome. So, uh, the title, as I mentioned, of this series is, is Phili in Philippians is Unchained, Living in the Freedom of Joy. And, and we're facing some difficulties in this, uh, in this time of, of a pandemic. Uh, and certainly the Apostle Paul, as he wrote this letter to the Philippians, was experiencing real trials. In fact, a, a, a literal trial that he was going to have before the Roman authorities, and he was chained up to a Roman guard uh, under lockdown all of this time. And yet, Paul said that he could still have joy. And so as we face our time of uncertainty and trial, with the COVID numbers rising in Ontario and across Canada again, uh, again, it can be a, a very challenging for us. Many of us are struggling uh, in different ways. And, and we can ask the question, how can we break free from those struggles? to experience genuine joy. And, and, and as I've said before, I believe that God through the Apostle Paul points the way. Now last Sunday, uh, the, the first Sunday of 2021, we considered the problem uh, of legalism, of, uh, of thinking that our walk with God is all about obeying a bunch of rules and how that could ultimately rob our joy by putting our spiritual effort and confidence in the wrong thing. Uh, this week we're going to look at Philippians 3 again, but we're going to move on to verse 4 through to verse 7 as Paul expands uh, on this topic. Uh, and, and we're going to consider uh, this question, spiritual life in a new year. There is no future uh, in the past. But before we dive into that, let me take a moment again to pray. Father, in these few minutes today, and as people are listening, I would ask that you, through the power of Holy Spirit, would speak to the hearts of each one that listens, that you'd help us to find comfort and hope and true joy uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we, could uh, we would be able to assess really what we put our trust in and where our trust needs to be, so that we might break through uh, into joy, that we might break free of our past, uh, and run into the joy and the freedom that ultimately is in Christ. So we pray you'd speak to us in this time. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. 
There's an article in USA Today that, that gives reports from the American Psychological Association. And they published some new research exploring the rise of perfectionism, uh, especially in young people. Compared to previous generations, today's college students are harder on themselves, more demanding of others, and report higher levels uh, of social pressure to be perfect. The study examined over 40,000 college students who took a special survey between 1989 and 2016. The more recent students scored higher in all three forms of perfectionism. Between 1989 and 2016, the scores for socially prescribed perfectionism uh, or perceiving the excessive expectations uh, of others increased by 33%. Other orientated ex expectations, putting unrealistic expectations on others, went up 16%. And self-orientated perfectionism, our, our irrational desire to be perfect, well, that increased by 10%. One of the lead researchers concluded, Today's young people are competing with each other in order to meet societal pressures to succeed. And they feel that like perfectionism is necessary in order to feel safe, socially connected, and of worth. Unfortunately, perfectionism can lead to anxiety, clinical depression, anorexia, and other health issues. You know, it's fascinating to me that in a, in, in a strange way we can approach our spirituality in the same way. By trying in ourselves to be the very best that we can, and we can place enormous expectations on ourselves and others. And Paul addresses this in this, in this text uh, this morning. Uh, and so I want to read to you from Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be focusing on verses 4 to 7, but I'm going to read from verse 1 to 7 to set the passage a bit more in its context. Philippians 3. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. <clears throat> Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. This morning I want us to think a little bit about the problem of putting confidence uh, in, in religious performance. Uh, this is where Paul starts. Uh, in, in the previous verses, he called out, uh, he called out those that, are, that he described as dogs, as evil workers, as, as those that mutilate themselves, uh, because they were putting confidence in, in the flesh, and, and particularly in, in certain forms of religious performance. And now Paul challenges them to, to a bit of a duel. Uh, you know, the kind of thing that maybe, you know, two men might say, you know, I can, I can, if they're at the gym, I, oh, I can lift more weights than you. Or, uh, or if they're fishing, oh, I've, I've caught a fish this big, you know, and, you know, somebody else says they caught, they didn't, they didn't catch as big a one. This idea of kind of a, a duel to who is better or who has done more. And that, and that duel ki kind of goes like this. Uh, oh, 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 you think you have a reason uh, to put confidence uh, in being a good Jew and, and checking all the re right religious boxes to make you a good person. Y you really think that? 
Well, I have far more reason. This is what he says in verses 4 to 6. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Someone might suppose, like some of these Judaizers, Judaizers, these people who wanted uh, Gentile believers to follow all these sorts of, uh, of rules, that they have what it takes to be considered spiritually superior to the Gentile Christians. Because of their Jewishness, they have confidence in the flesh. And Paul says, I, I have a far greater reason to, to have that kind of confidence. confidence. I, I've got way more reason than any of you to put confidence in myself. And, and then he starts out in verse 5 to give this resume of, of religious superior standing. And, and he gives a list of seven qualities uh, that he mentions here in verse 5. He says, circumcised the eighth day. Well, what's the big deal about that? Well, Genesis 17 and the covenant that God made with Abraham required that this would be so, that you would be circumcised on the eighth day. And so Paul met, met that requirement. But there's a lot more that he has implied when he says that. What he's implying is that he's a Jew by birth. And the reason that was important is he's saying, I didn't become a Jew some, sometime later. I, I, didn't I wasn't a proselyte. I didn't become a Jew at some later time. No, no, no. I was born a, a Jew. I, I received my circumcision before any of you. I received it at the eighth day. I, and so I am superior to any of you. And then he says of the people of, of Israel, that he's a true descendant of the nation of Israel. Again, not a proselyte, not somebody that's converted to Judaism at some later point, but somebody who could truly find their, their, their origin in being a national Jew. So he says, I, I'm better than you. You want, you want a resume of, of spiritual uh, religious understanding? You want to be the perfect Jew? That's me. I was circumcised the eighth day. I'm from the people of Israel. And then he says of the tribe of Benjamin. What was the important thing about that? Well, this was a key tribe in Israel. Uh, and although it was a small tribe, there was three important things uh, that, that about this tribe of Benjamin. Uh, it remained faithful to the southern kingdom. When, it, when is, you may not, in the history of the Old Testament, you can read about it, there was a time when the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons uh, of Israel or Jacob, uh, they were all one nation, but then eventually they were split, and the ten northern tribes did not stay as faithful to God, but two southern tribes did, Judah and this tribe of Benjamin. And so it was a more faithful tribe, so he's from a, uh, one of those tribes. Uh, and, but it was also the capital of, of Jerusalem. It was, the, it was located... Uh, there in Jerusalem, and was so, or Jerusalem was located within it, and so it was the capital city, the the city of Zion, that special city, was in Benjamin, and and uh, and Saul was from that tribe, or Paul was from that tribe, and also the from that tribe came the very first king, Saul. Uh, and Saul, if you know the apostle Paul, prior to be calling Paul to be to being called Paul, he was also called Saul. He had another name, and, and that was where he got his name from, from the first king of Israel. And so he's from this very significant tribe, and, and so it's another check that he can put on this religious superiority box or, or this religious resume. Uh, that look at all of the things that I have achieved. Now, some of these things are, are things of birth. He, he didn't choose to be circumcised the eighth day, but he was. He didn't choose to be from the nation of Israel or for the tribe of Benjamin, but he was. Those rea were realities that were true of him. And then he says a Hebrew of Hebrews. And wh what does this mean? Well, it means that Paul was raised in a Hebrew family, and that he followed Hebrew tradition. I mean, he knew, he knew the Hebrew language and the Hebrew customs. He, he wasn't some kind of uh, Jewish, or, or sorry, uh, uh, Greek Jew, 
or Hellenistic Jew that, that, that there was in, in that time. No, he was, he was of a pure stock than that in that not only was he nationally Jewish, but he kept his culture. You could think about in Canada, you have the, the province of Quebec, and there are people who are very concerned in Quebec to maintain their cultural heritage, to maintain their French language, and to be able to be fluent in it, and to be able to write it, and, and to be able to speak it, and all of those things. Well, here, uh, Paul was not only a Israelite, a true Jew from the tribe of Benjamin, but he was somebody maintaining his culture. He was somebody that not knew Hebrew, followed the Hebrew customs, all of those things. So check another box that he was superior to, uh, to a lot of other Jews in terms of being a pure Jew, the right Jew, all of those things. He was aligned uh, with all of those Jewish customs. Now those were qualities, those four qualities were ones that Paul was born with. And now we have some more, three more, but these are more achievements that Paul accomplished within Judaism. Uh, he says next, in regard, as regard to the law, or as to the law, a Pharisee. Well, what does that mean? That meant that Paul was a part of the strictest and most devout group or sect within Judaism. They followed the Jewish laws in, in, in the closest way possible. They were the ones that were the most stringent. And so Paul is from this elite group uh, within Judaism. Not only, is he, not, not only is he born a Jew and circumcised the eighth day and, and from the tribe of Benjamin and, and maintaining his culture, but he's also a, a Pharisee, a leader amongst all the, amongst all the Jewish uh, leaders and one that was a part of the most... Uh, elite sect within Judaism and so he had that standing uh, as well uh, and then it says in verse 6 as to zeal a persecutor of the church now this is a really interesting and kind of ironic statement that Paul makes here these people that were these people that Paul calls the dogs, the evil workers, the false circumcision in the earlier verses, the the what I've described as or what has been described as Judaizers, people trying to take Christians and say you need to follow all these Jewish laws, all these rules to have an, the the right kind of standing with God and to be elite uh, in that sense, like we are. Uh, well, Paul has an interesting thing he's saying. These Judaizers are trying to make things difficult for, Jew, for Gentile believers by making them follow these Jewish practices. Uh, and they saw themselves as zealous in doing that, as committed to God. We're, we're doing more for God because we're trying to make these people become like us. Well, Paul says he greatly surpassed that. He greatly surpassed that because he persecuted the church. In his zeal for God... He, and his desire to, he desired to stop uh, what he thought was a false Messiah and, and, and that those who, who were followers of the way, followers of Jesus Christ, he wanted to stop them. They were part of a false sect and they needed somebody with the zeal to step in and put a stop to this. We're not going to let this thing grow. We're not going to let this Christianity sect, this, this way, get any bigger. We've got we to snuff it out. We've got to get rid of them. We have to stop them. And so in an, in an ironic twist, Paul suggests that he's more zealous uh, for maintaining Jewish traditions than the, these people were. And yet he, he's going here a little bit further than what they ever intended to do. But he's saying, look at I'm more zealous for, God, for God's purposes as a Jew, uh, if that's what's right, uh, than you are. And then he makes one more claim. He says, a persecutor of the church, and then he says, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Blameless in relation to the law. What does that mean? Does that mean that the Apostle Paul actually thought that he was perfect in obeying God's law? No. He knew better than that. What he says is that the righteousness which is in the law he was blameless in. This is the sort of righteousness that isn't an inner devotion and love towards God, but, but rather an ex the external following of the rules that the Jews had. If you read Romans 7, uh, and especially the latter part of it, it's evident that Paul knew he could not obey, uh, that he could not be right with God by obeying the law. 
And the reason he knew that is because he failed to obey. That what this has to do with this blamelessness he's talking about is, is more with, with ritual and following ceremonial laws and being a strict observer of those things that he followed all and checked all of those boxes perfectly and was blameless in that sense. And so Paul has this incredible resume and he's giving this, he's showing this example and he's giving this as a warning. And he gives this example and warning because he knows that it's possible for the Christians in Philippi to put stock in something they shouldn't. Paul uses the word confidence. Where do we put our confidence? And Paul says here in the flesh uh, or in, in other words in our achievements. See, in the years that I've been a pastor, I've seen people put confidence in the fact that they, they've been to Bible college or seminary. They won't tell me that. Yo, well, I went to Bible school, or I have a Bible school degree, or I went to seminary. They were accomplished like Paul. Apostle Paul studied under Gamaliel, the, the great, uh, a great, great Pharisee and leader. Some people put confidence in that. I've seen people put confidence in the fact that they were baptized or in their denomination, that they're Baptist or Presbyterian or or Pentecostal or or, or, uh, or, or part of the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church or whatever it may be. They put confidence in that, what church they're a part of. And the fact that they're, they have been baptized or that they're a member of a local church. I've talked to people who put confidence in their good works. They, they like to think about the good things that they've done, how they've particularly maybe helped the poor or helped people in need and, and those things. And those are good things to do. Those are things that God encourages us to do and he wants us to do. It's not the doing those things isn't the problem. The problem is when we, when we think we're checking off boxes and it makes us superior to somebody else and makes us in a, puts us in a better standing with God. Others put confidence in how much of the Bible they know. Or perhaps how many memory verses they can recite. You know, people that can recite whole chapters of the Bible. And, and again, I encourage Bible memory, Bible reading, Bible knowledge. We, that's how God communicates to us. But when we put our trust in that, you know, then we have a, then we have a problem. I remember a young girl winning an award and you know she was give, because she could recite the most memory verses she was given some kind of leather bound great big bible uh at some kind of a camp and that and and you know when I got to talk to her later and and really talked to her I found out she wasn't even sure that she believed any of it but because she could do this external thing and had a good memory a good mind for memorizing you know she 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 gets uh rewards fascinated by this turkey that's outside our church building it's beautiful uh anyway we'll get back to where we were sorry about that uh we're live it's great that is a wonderful thing well when we do that there, there's a number of things that that, that that can happen that are very negative not only are we putting our trust in the wrong things but we can make other people feel make ourselves feel superior other people feel inadequate what about the people that haven't been to Bible school? Or people that struggle to learn and, and, and memorize the Bible? Or people that don't have the health and the ability to really to help others? They can be made to feel like they're lesser Christians if they buy into this idea that our performance is what makes us right with God. And that if we do all these things that somehow we're superior or we're better or God recognizes us in a better way. That it's based on our performance. Paul recognized. And he warns us against putting our trust uh, in our spiritual performance. The confidence in in religious performance doesn't get us anywhere. And and so here Paul lays out a very strong resume of somebody who was a pure Jew. uh, And and a Pharisee that studied under the leading Pharisee, uh, Gamil. Uh, he was he was just at the he was at the height of being very successful and, and respected for everybody religiously uh, and culturally in his society he was at the top uh, in terms of being a respected Jew and yet Paul understood something 
that we also need to understand, and this leads to, to my next point, that there is no future in past performance and that we need to consider it as nothing. Here's what he says in verse 7, whatever things, whatever things were gained to me. Paul says that at one time these things were gain to him. At one time, this is where he put his confidence. Uh, in a sense, religiously, he was a huge success in the sight of those around him, not only a pure Jew, but a, a Pharisee with the highest training, fluent in Hebrew, chosen to persecute the church, uh, which he did well. He, he had it all. And here this verb is an imperfect tense in Greek, which means that over a period of time in the past, Paul said that the, these things were, were, were gains. They were gains to him. That's plural, gains. Uh, I've gained this, 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 this. These are all gains for me. But something changed all of that for the Apostle Paul. You can read about it in Acts 9, where he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And that changed everything for the Apostle Paul. What did he do with, with all of these gains, all of these things that made him so successful, uh, considered better than anyone else? What did he do with all those gains? He bundled them up together. <laughs> you could say in, in, in one big garbage bag. And threw it away. Because it says here that he counted it as loss. And that loss is singular. So I have all these gains. Multiple things that I've gained. But I'm putting them all together as one thing. And I'm saying that it is loss. I'm casting it away because it's loss. And why? Why does he do that? Why does he say I'm casting it away as loss? He says that this, this is why. For the sake of Christ. What Paul's saying to these Philippian believers, don't, don't, don't think about your performance. Get rid of all of that. Cast it away as lots. Don't go in your past efforts or performance. Put, cast that away as lots for the sake of Christ. Paul knows that everything is worth losing for the sake of Christ. And Paul knows that the gains that he receives are, are far greater and I could talk about those as we go on to the next verses, but I don't want to take Kyle Bott's sermon away from him because he's going to be doing that for us next week. But I do want to ask, what about you this morning? Or, wh or whatever time you're watching this, what is your hope? See, there's no future in holding on to your own spiritual performance. And I want to ask you, have, have you given up trusting in yourself? And, and is your full trust in Christ alone? It's great in the new year to say, I'm going to read more of the Bible. I'm going to pray I'm more. I'm, I'm going to memorize more Scripture. I'm going to, I'm going to get more involved in the, in the church and serve in different ways. And, uh, and I'm going to use my, my gifts to serve. All of those things are things that, that God would want you to do and, and that I would love you to do. But if you're going to put your trust in those things... There's no future in that. There's nothing good in that. You need to get rid of that. Of putting your confidence in those things. And have you given up then trusting in yourself? And is your full trust in Christ alone? Maybe you're not sure... Uh, about what I'm talking about this morning. This may, this may be new to you if you haven't been following uh, uh, through the book of Philippians before or have had much encounter with the Bible or, or the truth of Jesus before. Uh, and I, I, if you'd like to know more, I would really be delighted to help you. Uh, you can contact me. Uh, my information's on the, on the, the screen as you're watching. And, and I would... I'd be very glad to share with you more about this. And one of the ways I'd like to offer that to you is, you know, it's not something you can maybe figure out in just a few minutes. It maybe takes some time. And, and one of the ways I'd, I'd like to offer to help you if you're interested and if you contact me is to participate with me in a, in a Zoom study. It has to be virtual, of course, with our lockdown uh, called Christianity Explored. 
then you, there you can find out more about what it means to uh, why Jesus came, uh, who, who he is, why he came, and what it means to follow him, and what it means uh, to put our full confidence in him. And I hope in this new year, if, you, if you're not doing that, uh, you will by the grace of God. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, we're going to close our service with another song uh, called The Stand. Who gave it?